Good morning, Crosswinds. How's everybody doing today? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> that was okay. Let's try it again. Good morning, Crosswinds. How's everybody doing today? All right, there we go. It's a blessing to be in the house of the Lord, is it not? Yes. We serve a good God. We have a great God. Good morning online. Thank you for joining us. We love you. All the areas in the church, let's go ahead and come inside. We're going to start worship. Everybody, let's go ahead and stand up. Uh, we're going to go ahead and pray before we start singing. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you, God, for all that you have done in our lives. Thank you, Lord, for leading us, guiding us, and protecting us throughout the week. We thank you, God, for each and every blessing that you give us. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. We ask that our hearts beat for you, that the songs we sing honor you, and that when all that we do, it worship and we praise you. We pray all these things and all God's people say amen. amen. Let's get into worship, y'all.
Young Adult Leaders here at Crosswinds, and we just want to welcome you all. Welcome here. If you're brand new, we'd love to get to know you. Please fill out a connection card in front of you and turn it into the lobby at the Next Step Center. We have a great gift for you, and we'd just love to get to know you. Uh, tell us uh, where you're from, how you heard about Crosswinds, and we want to hear your story, so welcome. And if you're new and you've been, this is your first time, or you've been coming for a little bit and you want to know more about Crosswinds, after the service today, we have our Step In class. This is just down the hall. Uh, you'll meet with the pastor and his wife and some other people here in the church. And you just have a meal and get to know uh, the people there and share your story and find out what Crosswinds is all about. So we encourage you to come to that. Meal is provided and child care is also uh, provided. And coming up next Sunday, we had a baptism or a couple baptisms a couple weeks ago. We have more baptisms coming up next Sunday. We're going to be having a baptism. So and that's just an open invitation to all of you. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you want to share what God has done in your life with the congregation here and you've not been baptized, what's holding you, holding you back? It's one of the first commandments that Jesus gave after you become saved. It's go and be baptized. So if you have not done that, if you've not shared that exciting event with the people in, here in the church, in, in your family, your friends, I encourage you to let us know and get baptized next week. There's nothing holding you back if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. So that is next week. So I, I really hope you will all take up that challenge if you have not done that so, um, yet. And, uh, oh, we have a cross, uh, the Operation Christmas Child coming up. So we have a, a video for that. What laid it on my heart? The Himbas need someone to give them the word of God. My vision for the Sarama Khan tribe is that we will share the gospel and to establish a host church here so that they also can receive the, the, the blessing of Christ. Through the gift boxes, we are going places that no church will be allowed. Places like Gamvi, that floating village. We are reaching those that have never heard the gospel. We find them having not even a Bible in their own language. Areas of the world where people need to know that God loves them and cares them and sent his son from heaven to this earth for them. God loves you and God loves me. Operation Christmas Child opened doors to evangelism, discipleship, and multiplication. When a child receives a shoebox, it shows them who God really is and how much he cares for them. We bring gift to the children, also the mothers and the fathers and their brothers and sisters also accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. Churches are using these shoe boxes, the greatest journey discipleship program, to reach out to the ends of the earth with the gospel. God sent his son to this earth on a rescue mission Jesus Christ died and shed his blood on the cross for our sins. And then on the third day, God in heaven said it's enough, and he raised his son to life. This is the good news, and we've got a responsibility to take this message to the ends of the earth. How cool is that? So... This is just a, a, a great opportunity for us to share the gospel with people around the world, people we will never meet, but we can fill, put, uh, grab one of these boxes, put toys and gifts in it, and there's going to be gospel tracks in there. And this is just an opportunity for us to share the gospel around the world. So if you'd like to pick one up, you can grab a box uh, out front, and they're due next week. So make sure if you have those boxes, make sure you bring it in next week so we can send them out. And uh, finally, uh, grandparents. So we have an exciting thing coming up, the Legacy Grandparenting Summit. That is next uh, Saturday. It's going to be here at the church. So if you're a grandparent and you want to learn, like, how can I really feed into the spiritual lives of my grandkids? This is a, a great opportunity to come. You'll, you'll watch a, a seminar, I believe it is, and, and uh, just get to know some of the other grandparents and encourage each other and, you know, share uh, the struggles you're ha having or, like, how can I really reach my grandkids 
Uh, maybe I feel distant from them or something like that. So I encourage you, that's next Saturday. If you want to know more about it, please check in the Next Step Center in the lobby. And uh, for all other announcements, uh, check online, the app, and the lobby. And thank you so much for your giving. You can give in the back uh, boxes or online or through the app. And I'll turn it over to Pastor Willie. Hi, I'm Willie Barron. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm the pastor here. I always tell everybody, when you come up, introduce yourself. So there you go. If you didn't know me, uh, say something after church. Hey, um, not only are we giving our regular giving, but one of the things we do at this time of year every year is we give what we call an ingathering offering. We've taken the theme from the Feast of Ingathering that the nation of Israel would practice at the end of the year, at the end of the harvest, and they would, it was basically an offering where they had an opportunity to give in uh, recognition of how God had blessed them throughout the year. And so we do that every year, and uh, it tends to be an offering that we use to do uh, work on the building. We've put a roof up. We've uh, redone the quad. We've remodeled the worship center. Last time I announced this, they said, you left out the best one of all. We built the cafe uh, a few years ago. And so uh, we want to encourage you, and as I always do, and what we do in our family is we always pray and ask God, what is it you want us to give? And we kind of like when it's an amount that we think is like, ugh, that's a little much, Lord. How, how are we going to be able to do that? But nevertheless, if he says that, then we start praying for it. And it is amazing. We have some, some great opportunities to see God work and to see extra funds come in. So I want to give you that opportunity as well. You know, giving is the only time in Scripture when God says, test me in this. He tells me. Malachi, or he says through Malachi, test me in this, uh, see if you can outgive me, I'm paraphrasing, you know, and see if af after you've given, if I don't throw open the floodgates of blessing. And so let's test him in this. Let's pray, be praying over the next couple of weeks. And then uh, when you give, make sure you make, you let us know which part of the offering is the in-gathering and which part of the offering is your regular offering. Or if you use the boxes in the back, we even have special in-gathering envelopes that you can give in as well. You can start giving right now through to the end of the year, but specifically we're going to be focusing uh, in a couple of weeks at our in-gathering service. Let's stand together and continue to worship him in song.
voice, let's sing this out. I'm calling on the God of Jacob, whose love endures through generations. I know that you will keep your
Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit this morning. Fill our hearts with peace, all the first of us this morning, and build our faith. May we feel your presence, Lord. May we listen to your word this morning.
praise to you this morning. We acknowledge your greatness. We acknowledge your power, your grace, and your love towards us. Oh, Lord Jesus, we thank you. We worship you this morning. Please be seated. Not in his worst nightmares that Matthew ever thought that he would end up where he is right now. In fact, if he could go back in time and make different decisions to get to a different destination, he would do it in a second. With where he's at now, he sits in a position where his parents have turned their backs on him. His friends were no longer his friends. And worst of all, he was even pretty disgusted with himself. His fellow countrymen, his fellow Jews considered him a sinner. In fact, guys like Matthew were considered to be actually worse than sinners. They were tax collectors. One day, Matthew finds himself, as he does every day, sitting at his post in his booth, collecting his taxes, and he notices a crowd of people hovering in the area, but these people weren't there to see him they were there to see this man, Jesus of Nazareth. And as he's doing his work, he's trying to listen to what Jesus is saying. But the people that are listening to Jesus were interrupting him as well. He tried to listen. And he hears about a man who had been paralyzed. And how Jesus had looked at this man and his friends and had seen, had recognized their faith in bringing this man to him. And of course, he heard of how Jesus had said to this man, your sins are forgiven. Some people laughed. Others started yelling at Jesus. He had no right, after all, to forgive people's sins. And then Jesus did the remarkable. He did the unthinkable. He looked at this paralyzed man and said, not only are your sins forgiven, but get up and walk and go home. And suddenly, the paralyzed man was no longer paralyzed. He got up and he went home. And he hears of how the people were astonished and began to glorify God. And as Matthew heard all of this that had happened, he saw Jesus begin to walk towards him. It was as if he was coming right at him, and suddenly Jesus is standing right there in front of Matthew and simply says to him, follow me. And it was like Matthew didn't even think about it. He got up, and he began to follow Jesus. He just walked away from his tax-collecting booth. And from that point on, Matthew knew his life had changed. He had been invited. No, no. He had been commanded by Jesus to join him in ministry to serve God and to serve others. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 9. We want to pick up where we left off last week. We've just seen Jesus, if you were here last week or seen it online, we've just seen Jesus heal this paralytic, forgive his sins, and then tell him to rise up and walk, because either of those things are easy for Jesus, right? 
I encourage you this morning to take notes. We have note cards at the door that were given out. If you didn't get one, put your hand up, and we'll make sure to get that to you. On the back are a series of questions that I've written for our life groups. The final life group is this week, and then we're going to move into the holidays, the Thanksgiving and Christmas season. And if you're joining with us online, all of that material that I've just talked about is available to you on our church app, so download that church app and get that material. As you've just heard, today Matthew is going to describe his own calling, his own obedience, if you will, to the command of Christ. And here's the thing, guys. We can't escape the reality, the, the truth, that we are all called by God. No, we are all commanded by God. And when or if we accept that call from him, our lives, like Matthew's, are going to be transformed, and we're going to see that today. You see, I believe that God has a mission for every one of us. He has a purpose. He has a plan for every one of our lives. Now, sometimes, let's be honest, sometimes we ignore that plan because maybe we don't like it. I don't want to do what I think God has called me to do. I know, Willie, you're always talking about going your world. You don't know my world. I don't really like the people in my world. <laughs> I just as soon, you know, leave them alone. Sometimes we don't hear God's plan for us. We don't put ourselves in a position to get into his word or to be in church under the teaching of the word of God. And so we can miss out. There's others of us, and I would count myself in this number at times, we kind of flirt with God's plan and purpose, don't we? We, we, sort, of, we sort of dip our toes in the water but we don't actually jump in and get wet. <laughs> and then to keep that metaphor going, there are those that hear the message and like Matthew, don't seem to hesitate one bit. They jump right into the water and swim away <laughs> with God's son, Jesus Christ. I believe, guys, that deep down, Every person wants a purpose. They're looking. Every one of us is looking for something bigger in our lives. We want to have a reason for what we are doing. And the people in your worlds are the same way. They want to have a reason for what they're doing. It's got to be more than this. Life has got to be more than just getting up every morning and going to work or going to school and coming home at night and watching some TV and having some dinner and going to bed and then getting up the next morning and doing the same thing day after day after day. It's why people wait for the weekends because there's a little bit of a break in the pattern. But they're not much better because Monday always returns. I believe, guys, that people want to make a difference in this world. That's part of the reason that I see people, I believe we see people that are, that are so restless. Because why? We were created in order to serve him. I love Ephesians, uh, Ephesians 2.10. It says, we are God's workmanship. We are God's masterpiece is really the, the impact of that word. We are his greatest creation. If, if God were here right now, he'd say, huh, look, at, uh, look at Greg right there. That's my greatest creation right there, Greg. And Kathy, she ain't bad either. She's my, she's my greatest creation. I mean, that's the way God, he would, he's bragging on us. We are his workmanship. I don't know if you, you, you imagine the impact of just that statement. I am created by God. I am his greatest creation. We're created in Christ Jesus. Why? What does it say? For, come on, you can read, for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And if we're not doing what God has prepared for us to do beforehand, if we're not doing that, is it any wonder we feel worthless? What happens when your car dies? Do you just let it sit there? Do you just park it there? No, you either get it fixed, unless you're me, and you do park it there for about 30 years. In the, I sold it, by the way, recently. So, and, and, and you know why I sold it? My wife is like, yes! <laughs> no more roadster in the backyard. And you know why I sold it? Well, for one, I got some money out of it. But I also sold it because I realized I am not ever going to allow that car to realize its purpose. 
Its purpose is to be out on the highway doing about 150 miles an hour, you know, tearing up the roads. That ain't going to happen with me. I finally came to that realization. And I found a guy who says, I want to restore it. I want to bring it back to what it's supposed to be. I want it to be, he didn't say all of this, but it would have been cool if he did. <laughs> I want it to realize its purpose, you know. He was sort of in love with it, and I can understand guys like that. <laughs> Today, guys, Matthew is going to give us quickly his own testimony He's going to do it interestingly in third person. <laughs> I'm going to, he's, Matthew is going to talk about a guy named Matthew, and that is, of course, him. He's going to talk about how he came to Christ, or as you've heard better than that, Christ came to him. And in his account this morning is a tremendous example for us to follow. The first thing we see here this morning is a surprising command by Jesus. Look at verse 9 of uh, chapter 9. As Jesus passed on from there, that means the house where he had just healed the paralytic. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And Jesus said to him, follow me. And Matthew rose and followed Jesus. Now, as you know, I mean, we've talked about this already in the introduction, and it's been sprinkled in throughout. Matthew had been a tax collector. He was an agent for the Roman government, the oppressors. He was, his job was to collect customs at, uh, at probably at the port, since Capernaum was a port city. No doubt, the disciples, as they are walking through the, through the, uh, the square there, they probably thought that uh, Jesus would steer clear of Matthew's tax booth. Why is that? Because, because of the nature of their job, tax collectors were hated. They were seen as traitors to their people. They were banned from the synagogue. They were shunned by their own people. They were, they were seen as corrupt. And the reason they were seen as corrupt is because they were corrupt. Part of the income that a tax collector derived came from overtaxing people. And if you could get away with it, you kept what, it, what you managed to overtax. The government was going to get theirs no matter what. But they pretty much left tax collectors alone. If you want to uh, get more out of them, if you're good enough and you can do that, then go ahead, skim off the top and keep that for yourself. So tax collectors did very well. They made a very good living. They wouldn't be trusted, though, by anyone else. They wouldn't be trusted as a friend. In fact, they were right up there because they were robbers and even murderers. The fact is that Jesus, a Jewish rabbi, even approaching Matthew, even getting in the, the, the same airspace as Matthew, who is the worst of sinners, would be scandalous. It's astonishing, although I don't know after a while what can really astonish us about Jesus. It seems like that's sort of par for the course for him. Now, granted, tax collectors were Jews, but they had sold out their own people in order to become wealthy, and people hated them for it. Now, you would think that this would be one of the last people that Jesus would choose to become part of his inner circle. Who, in fact, would want to hang out with a tax collector? Especially when another guy in that inner circle was a guy by the name of Simon, not Simon Peter. They called him Simon the Zealot. And Simon the Zealot was a part of a group called the Zealots, and their whole mission in life was the violent overthrow of the Roman government. And so among these 12 men in the inner circle of Jesus, two of them are mortal enemies. Two of them, I mean, here, here's a guy that wants to violently overthrow the Romans, and this guy has sold out to that very same government. Doesn't seem like a, a, a staff where there's going to be peace and harmony, is, does it? But when Jesus turned toward that booth, they, his disciples, they probably thought, yeah, okay, he's going over there. I know what he's going to do. He's going to go after Matthew. He's going to criticize him. He's going to say, oh, you of all people need to listen to what I'm saying. You of all people need to change your life. Imagine their surprise when Jesus simply says to him, follow me. And they're even greater surprised when Matthew did. I mean, Matthew's making a good living at this job, not so much with the disciples. They didn't have anything, you know, by design, you know, don't, don't take anything with you. Don't just, just live off of whatever people give you. In, in spite of all of that, 
I got to tell you guys, I am not surprised that Matthew answered Jesus' call. I think Matthew had probably become pretty tired of the life that he was living. I think Matthew knew better than most people that money cannot buy happiness. He's there. He, know, he knows what it's like to be rich, kind of like the, 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 the writer of Ecclesiastes. I know what it is to be rich. I know what it is to be poor. By the way, guys, when Jesus said, follow me, that wasn't a suggestion. That wasn't even so much an invitation. The word that is used there is an imperative. It's a command. It's like when my dad would say to me, Willie, follow me. <laughs> I didn't think about it. I didn't know. Oh, let, let me see. He's inviting me to follow. No, he's not inviting me. He's saying, get over here. And that's what Jesus is doing here. So when he commanded Matthew to follow him, he was saying essentially to Matthew, I believe, Matthew, I'll take you. The other people here, even my own followers, they might spit on you. They'll turn their back on you. They'll avoid you. But Matthew, I am willing to work with you. And more important, I'm willing to work in you. Last week, Jesus claimed the ability to forgive sins. You know what he's doing this week? He is demonstrating to us the range, if you will, of sinners. Sinners that he could and would forgive. Yeah, okay, well, he, he'll forgive sins. And, and, and our thinking, that's going to be he'll forgive the sins of all the good people, right? Right? all the respectable people. No, Jesus goes right to the worst person in that square at that time and forgives his sins. And I think, guys, this is really important for us because, you see, some of us think that God would never want me to do anything for him. I mean, after all, look who, I know myself, you don't, but I do. <laughs> What's that old line preachers like to use? If, uh, if, I, if I knew your sins, I probably wouldn't want to be talking to you, but, you know, take heart. If you knew my sins, you probably wouldn't want to listen to me, okay? We're all in this together, and we realize that, and we think to ourselves, what would God really want to have anything to do with me for? I'm not good enough. I don't have the skills or abilities. I'm, I, I'm a really bad person. I've done things. I'm too young. I'm too old. I have a reputation. The list could go on and on. We come up with all kinds of reasons, don't we, to justify not answering that command of Jesus, follow me. <laughs> when Jesus called Matthew... Matthew had to get up and follow him. He had to make a conscious decision to follow Jesus. He couldn't say, I'll follow you, Lord, just as soon as I get off work this afternoon. I'm going to stay here right now in my comfortable booth, making my comfortable living, and then when I'm done with that, I will follow you. He couldn't do that. He had to take a step of faith right then and there. Jesus wasn't saying, follow me when you're ready. He was saying, follow me right now. Let's go. We have a contrast in Matthew 19. We see the, the rich young ruler who approached Jesus and wanted to know, what, should I, what do I need to do to have eternal life? And they have a, a little back and forth. But in the end, Jesus says, if you want to have eternal life, then take all of your money, give it to the poor, and come and follow me. He made the same request of that rich young ruler that he's making here with Matthew. Only a different result, because that guy went away downcast, because it says he had great riches. He wouldn't leave them. But not Matthew. Guys, God is calling us to get off the sidelines and to go to our worlds on behalf of Jesus Christ, believing and knowing that we have been called. No, even more important, we have been commanded by God to do this. And it requires us to do the same thing we see Matthew doing here, consciously getting up, making a plan, and following Jesus, even if we don't know where he's taking us. That's what these cards are. This is a plan. 
I consciously pray and ask God, who are the people in my world? Who are those 8 to 15 people that I live next to, that I go to work with, that I'm in school with, that I see regularly day by day? Who are those people? And I write them down, and I begin to pray for them, and I'm looking for opportunities. Trust me, guys, when you start to pray, get ready, because if you pray for opportunities, they're going to happen. God is going to answer that prayer. And then I'm going to invite them. And what better time of year to be inviting people to church than the holidays? And sometimes they're going to ask us questions that, that maybe we don't know the answers to. And so we go and we get more, more information for them. And we want to help them out. And we bring in people that can help. We prepare ourselves to be better servants. That's the plan. Look what happens next. We see a commendable response by Matthew, even beyond his first response, which was to just get up and follow Jesus, just do what Jesus says. Of course, we can and do commend Matthew for answering his call, his command, but it didn't stop there. Look at verse 10. And as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. Mark and Luke make it very clear as they recount this, this situation that this wasn't just any house. This was Matthew's own house. And I'm, I'm pretty sure this is going to be a pretty swanky house. Okay, And Matthew made sure somehow that his world was there. His world of tax collectors and sinners. I can almost imagine how the conversation must have gone. Matthew asked Jesus as they're walking away, where are we going, Jesus? And Jesus says, well, Matthew, I'm going to your house. Text your friends. Tell them all to come. We're going to have dinner at your place. Or maybe even better, I would love it if this were the way. I can't categorically say how it happened, but there's really only one or two ways. It was either Jesus' decision or it was Matthew's. And I'd kind of love it if it was Matthew's decision because here's Matthew is so excited that Jesus, the rabbi, reached out to him that he wants to introduce his friends, i.e. his world, to Jesus as well. In a sense, you could almost say that Matthew became one of the very first missionaries. He calls his friends. He's saying to them, you, you got to meet this guy. He's changed my life. Trust me. Just come to dinner tonight. And let me tell you, and let me tell you what, what I think. And I'm sure Matthew, he'd had many meals with these guys, these tax collectors and their sinners and his friends. In fact, that's probably the only friends that each of them had. Nobody wanted to associate with them, so they had to associate with themselves. They were the worst of Jewish society. People would look at them and say they're backstabbers and traitors and stealing from their own people. And so they, not just the tax collectors, I love the way it says the tax collectors and the other sinners. Okay, As bad as tax collectors were, I imagine what the other sinners must have done. So that's their social group. And they're all together. It is so cool, is it not? He gets it right away. Matthew doesn't want to keep Jesus all for himself. He wants to share his new faith. He wants to share his personal hope that he now has, his new purpose with his friends, his friends, his outcast friends who also needed what he had. And guys, isn't that exactly what we are supposed to be doing? We shouldn't want to be holding on to Jesus. We shouldn't want to be not sharing him with others. Trust me, guys, there is plenty of Jesus to go around. You, you can give and give and give. Somebody once said it's like a candle, you know. No matter how many candles you light with a candle, you're not going to run out of candlelight, okay? It's always going to be there. And here's the thing. Matthew didn't get in his friend's face. I don't think he did anyway. All he had to do was invite them to a safe place. There wasn't a whole lot of safe places for those kinds of people. They couldn't just go out to dinner. How uncomfortable would that be? Look at over there, it's the sinners and the, and, the, and the tax collectors. No, he invited them to his house. And they knew Matthew, and they knew that was a safe place. Now, maybe you don't have that option. Maybe for various reasons you can't bring them to your home, but maybe you can take the people in your world once in a while, out to dinner, or for coffee, or even to church. It's one of the reasons we build these inviting spaces. 
You say, well, what do you need a, a coffee house for? Can't people go to Starbucks? Yes. <laughs> it's not about the coffee. It's about the space. It's about that place where people can come and make connections with people in their worlds and have significant conversations. That when church is over, we get to go out to, the, cof to, the, to the, the, the coffee bar or the patio outside after we finish building that this year and talk about, what did you hear today and, and can I help you understand anything? During the holidays, I've shared this and I'll probably share it every week. Studies show that people who do not attend the church overwhelmingly say that they would come to church if somebody would invite them. The problem you guessed it, people don't invite them. And so they don't come. Shame on us for that. Let's be like Matthew. Let's invite them to worship. Let's, let's maybe meet them at the door. Better yet, maybe pick them up and bring them so they don't have to come in by themselves. This can be an intimidating place. I know it's not for most all of us, but this can be an intimidating place the first time. I can't tell you how many people I have met that have come here uh, for other things like funerals or weddings or we used to have a theater de uh, pr uh, department and we would do theater productions. And it, it amazed me that people would come in and say, oh, so this is a church, huh? This is what a church is like. These are grown adults that have never been in a church. They don't know what goes on here. And they certainly think, you know, this place is not for me. So invite them, bring them. And invite them to something that, where things are happening. And if they have questions and that they don't know the answers, say to them, or maybe you don't know the answers, say to them, I'll get the answer. But whatever we do, reach out. Allow God to transform you. Allow God to transform how you see yourself, how you see your relationships with others in your world. So Matthew has a commendable response. He does all the right things so far. He invites his friends. It's not enough that he's come to know Christ. He's obeyed that command. He wants his friends to be there as well, and we should as well. So that's commendable. He, he has this great response to Jesus. Others, not so much, and we can pretty much guess who that's going to be, right? The next thing we see is a critical response by, once again, the religious leaders, the Pharisees. Verse 11, and when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? <laughs> so the Pharisees, the religious uh, mucky mucks, you know, the grand poobahs of the place, they saw what's going on, and notice how they operate. They don't confront Jesus directly. No, they go around behind Jesus' back. Why does, your, why does your leader follow this? I, I know what they probably are doing. They're probably trying to get Jesus' followers to doubt Jesus, make them ashamed of Jesus. Look at the kind of people that he's hanging around with. Maybe his followers will turn away, and Jesus won't be the threat that he's become. I mean, after all, what respectable teacher and leader would go into the homes of sinners, of tax collectors, and hang out with the sick, and touch lepers, and talk to prostitutes. Who in their right mind would do stuff like this? Certainly no good teacher would ever do that. The Pharisees, you see, they were the rule keepers. They kept the rules that they made up. That kept the rules that they wanted to keep and made other pe people follow the rules that they so much didn't want to keep. Everybody wanted to be like the religious leaders. They were the in crowd with the Romans. They got breaks. They were the polar opposites of the tax collectors. They had special treatment. They had the best seats in the temple. When people saw religious leaders coming, they would move out of the way. Everybody else was beneath them. And the tax collectors were at the bottom. And here is Jesus right in the guy's house. Guys, you need to understand something. And, and this is tough. Because you see, we all want to fit in, in some ways, with the people that are around us. We, we don't want to be, you know, I, I want to have good relationships with the people that I work with and with my neighbors. And, you know, I, I, don't, I don't want to be that guy that nobody can be around. And yet, Sometimes, guys, we are not just, not sometimes, but all the time, we are not called to fit in with everyone else. We're called to be unique. We are called to stand out. We have the message of life in the midst of a dead world. We have light in a dark room. It's kind of hard to hide if you think about it. 
So guys, right from the beginning, we will face ridicule. Do you see what people are saying about Christianity? And it's going to accelerate. I can't, it, it, it always gets me this time of year when, when Christmas and it happens again at Easter. You start seeing all the negative stories about how Christians behave and the crazy beliefs they have. And, 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 the, and they think about the things that we say about Jesus. It's just crazy. You guys are nuts. And at a very minimum, keep your thoughts to yourself, you, you self-righteous person. You, you think you're better than me? Huh? The Apostle Paul experienced this, and here's what he had to say about it. For I am, now, am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. <laughs> Guys, our faith has to be real. It has to be visible. We are serving Jesus Christ, not other people. And honestly, I'll be the first to say that's tough at times. I don't like being the, 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 the guy that people look at and, and don't feel good things about. Maybe like with the Pharisees with Jesus. Maybe we're being undermined. I know that feeling as well. We're being talked about behind our back. We're being laughed at. You have to be able to speak with kindness and gentleness and share the reason that we have our hope in Jesus Christ. Even with people that you know that when you're not there, Maybe they're saying things to other people about you. And look how Jesus responds. Once again, verse 11. The Pharisees saw this. They said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard it, he said, Those who are well have no need for a physician, but those who are sick. That's Jesus' mission in a nutshell. He's a spiritual doctor. And when Jesus here refers to the sick, he is talking about those who are spiritually sick, those who are dying in their spirits. The spiritually sick people, though, as much as we don't want to admit it, are you and me. It's all of us. It's the members of our family. It's those people that we love the most. It's our friends. It's our enemies. Ultimately, guys, it is every one of us. We are all sick. We are all spiritually sick. We are sinners in need of a physician, and Jesus is the doctor that we need. But he's also saying that, he's, uh, that he is the doctor tending to those who do what? Who realize that they're sick. The Pharisees didn't think they were sick. They didn't think they were sinners. You can't classify me in that group. So guess what? They're not looking for a doctor. They're not looking for what Jesus is offering, but Jesus is also telling them, and he's telling me, and he's telling you that physicians deal with the sick. They don't deal with the healthy, but everybody is sick, okay? And how can people be cured of that if the doctor won't associate with them, like the Pharisees? <laughs> oh, we care about you people, but we're just not coming around you, and we don't want to have anything to do with you, and we've basically written you off. How would it be if your doctor behaved that way? I've been trying to get an appointment with my doctor, and uh, he won't see me because I'm too sick. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't want to be around sick people, and so that, you know, that's, that's crazy. And in a similar way, guys, how can we help our worlds if we are not willing to associate with them? We need to associate with tax collectors and sinners and sometimes the worst of society just like Jesus. So this morning we've seen a surprising command by Jesus. Jesus asks one of the worst of the worst to follow him. We've seen a commendable response by Matthew. He invites his world to also experience what he's experienced. And finally, a critical response by the Pharisees. They chose, instead of accepting it or receiving it, they decided that they're going to miss out on what Jesus is doing. But there's one more thing this morning, and that is a second command, really, to all of us by Jesus. He gives the Pharisees, if you will, a homework assignment. He says to them in verse 13, go and learn what this means. Write this down, guys, huh? Quote, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, unquote, for I came to call the righteous, but not, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. What's he doing here? He's quoting from the Old Testament, Hosea 6.6. 6. And Hosea 6 says, says, I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God 
rather than burnt offerings. By the way, I I don't have time this morning, but I would encourage you, read through all of Hosea chapter 6. You're going to get some interesting insights, particularly before you go into your life groups this week. But what, what is he saying here? The Pharisees, you see, made sure that they made all of the perfect and proper sacrifices. They knew the word of God, and they did. And they followed the law to a T, but they totally lacked compassion for sinners or anybody else for that matter. People, when steadfast love is missing, as Hosea says here, then the sacrifices, the knowledge, the fasting, the giving, the church attendance, the Bible reading, everything else, guys, it's all meaningless if there is no steadfast love. What did Micah say? What is, oh God, what do you require of us to to love mercy? To, uh, I can't think of it now. (laughs) There you go. Yes. Talk to Greg if you want to know math. It's Micah 6 8, and it normally comes to me like that, but I'm getting older. Anyway, (laughs) look what happens though. And learn what it means when it says that Jesus came to call sinners. And that is not just tax collectors and sinners. It's the Pharisees as well. That's what Jesus is saying there. I came to call sinners, which means all of us. We're all in that boat. Romans 3.23, right? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That one I know. (laughs) I believe, guys, that Jesus is commanding us this morning. And I hope you recognize that. He's not giving us a suggestion. We're not sitting here saying, well, this sounds interesting. Let me think about this. No, we're talking about a command here. I think he's giving us an an assignment, and I would encourage you to write it down right now. Go and learn what Hosea 6.6 means. And then allow others to see Jesus in you and be ready to share his love, his grace, His mercy with them. What better time of year to do that as we come into this holiday season? We have a pretty obvious contrast in this passage this morning. I mean, there's we can go one way or we can go the other. The question is, how will I approach my world in these next six weeks? When supposedly, if the studies, if the polls are correct, they are more open to hearing from us. They are more open to take advantage of our, of our invitations. How am I approaching the people in my world? Well, how will I see them? Will I see them like the Pharisees and essentially say, I don't want anything to do with them? Uh, you know, the, these guys are a little rough around the edges. I don't think they can uh, monitor their, their language. They don't seem to dress well. They kind of stink. I mean, you know, you could come up with all kinds of reasons. Or they're just not the kind of people that would want to go to church. I don't want to offend them by even ed, uh, inviting them to come. Basically, you're being a Pharisee from what we've seen today. Or like Matthew, Jesus commands, follow me. He doesn't even seem to think about it. He gets up, leaves the booth, leaves everything behind, follows Jesus, but it doesn't end there. He goes immediately out and invites the people in his world, come. I've found this guy, Jesus. I've experienced amazing things from him, and I want you to experience the same. I hope that's what you want for the people that you're praying for on your card. I hope you want them to meet Jesus There is no better time than right now. Maybe we should have a few, uh, I call them Matthew parties (laughs) in our neighborhoods. When people, when when you can open up your home and open up your heart and, and invite people to come and meet you, but also meet the one who changed me, who makes me want to invite you into my home. Today's takeaway is first off, the obvious one, what is Jesus commanding me to do? It was pretty clear for Matthew, follow me. Well, I think it's pretty clear for all of us. He's asking that of every one of us. That's what he's commanding us to do. Follow him in the fullness of what those two little words mean. Number two, how have I responded to Christ? You've heard the command, and let's be honest, most of us in this room have heard the command over and over and over again. How are you responding? Are you doing it? Are you, again, it's a command. We're not talking about a suggestion. Go into all the world and make disciples. 
Oh, let me think about that. No, no, there's no thinking about it. That's a command. That's an imperative. Do it. And number three, how do I respond to, quote, <laughs> sinners? I got news for you. No matter how you respond to them, you are one. <laughs> We're all in the same boat. We've got different manifestations of sin, but how I respond to them goes a long way to showing people Jesus Christ or not showing people Jesus Christ. And that's the sad thing is that so many people have turned away from a Jesus that is not Jesus because maybe at times they've seen me. And if I'm supposed to be the representative of Christ, I don't want any part of that. Lord, forgive me for those times in my life. Let's pray. Father, I thank you as we stand on the threshold of this season of the year when people are more open, at least that's what we hear, more open to spiritual things. And Father, honestly, whether they're open to it or not really isn't the issue. The command is there. We are to follow you and we are to make disciples. We are to love God and love people. We are to, to go with Jesus and, and grow with Jesus and go to our worlds. It, it's very simple, Lord and yet so profound. Father, empower us with your Holy Spirit within us to carry out what we've, you've called us to do, what we've seen in the life of Matthew this morning. Lord, may that be true of every one of us. And we'll give you the praise and the glory for all that results. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Willie, for a great message and a challenge for each one of us. Please stand as we close.
I, for one, am so thankful that I was not too sick and scared away Jesus, but that he was taking, willing to book an appointment with me, and he came and made a house call for my sake. Amen? Amen. But like Willie shared today, there's a challenge to follow him, and there's a challenge so much more with that, with our relationship with God. And we have a decision to make. How are we going to respond? Are we going to respond critically? Or are we going to fully dive into our relationships with the Lord? Right? We were all just singing a moment ago. Lead us, Lord. Spirit, lead me where I trust is without borders. And I wonder, is that something we were just singing? Or is that a true anthem of our hearts? Is that a true statement that we're making? God, take me to places that I, I can't even comprehend. Like Peter, when he looked at Jesus on the water and he said, God, if you're calling me, Jesus, if that's you, have me walk on the water. Is that, a, is that what we're claiming? Or are we just singing the words? I want us to be a people like Paul, who was one way, met Jesus and totally radically changed. And he went and he listened to those commands. And we had one, a great one today of share it with your world, share Jesus with our worlds. The holidays is a great time to do it. Amen. Amen. Just a quick announcement for those who are joining us in the meet and greet. Uh, for our lunch, we're actually going to walk out these doors to your guys' left, to the quad. We're going to grab our lunch from there, and then we're moving to the room just to my left right here in the classroom next to us, and we'll share our lunch there. Let's pray. Father, Lord, Lord, I pray that these worship songs, this sermon, isn't just something that we say or repeat or sing just for the sake of singing it, Lord. I pray that it is a true cry of our hearts. And Lord, remind us that, yeah, those waves will come and those challenges will happen, Lord, but you keep us afloat. Lord, I pray that our hearts will be truly to seek after you and that will reflect in how we share with our worlds. We pray these things in your heavenly name, Father. Fill us with your spirit. Wash us clean. And in your name, amen. Have a blessed week.